Um, yeah, that's what I, what I basically said. I'm going to give you a little bit of overview about Linux file systems and how it integrates into Linux kernel world, what, what, it, actually, uh, what it actually means. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges we are facing today and what uh, is expected to come because it is a very exciting era uh, right now where you know the, the storage is changing. Um, the, all, the, all the storage industry is actually developing you know, very interesting features. Uh, so we'll see, we'll talk a little, little bit about that. And then uh, I'm going to give you a specific exa examples of uh, three file systems. In my opinion, uh, those are the most uh, common file systems. And we'll going, I'm going to mention something, uh, what has been done in those file systems, how, how, they, how they scale, how they are reliable, and things like that. Um, and the last point, um, of course, I'll give you some uh, space for questions, but if you have any questions, just ask right away. Don't, you don't need to wait uh, up until to the end of the, con of, the, of the presentation. So let's talk about the, the file system in general. Uh, historically, Linux has you know, a lot of great number of uh, file systems uh, that are in the kernel. Uh, some of them are like, a, like a ext4 or xfs. Are the, those are the file system you can, you can put on your laptop or on your desktop, on your server. But some of those are really special. They have special purpose in the, in, the, in the Linux world. Or they might be even virtual, like you can't store anything in there. It's like a ProtzFS or uh, SysFS and stuff like that. So um, I have never actually counted all the file systems, but I think there are about 40 of them in the, in the Linux kernel tree. I think that's, that's about right. Uh, kernel file systems as a subsystem in the kernel are really closely related to the other, file, uh, to the other subsystems. Uh, and that's especially block layer, memory management, and uh, VFS as well. Obviously, when you see some problems like performance problems, uh, then you can, you, know, you can blame the file system. Or it actually might, the, the actual problem might be somewhere else. It might be in the in the block layer, or it might be in the memory management as well. So this, this kind of system, I mean, it's really, everything is really closely related. And I, I will go show you a graph of a Linux IO stack, and you will see that uh, Linux file systems are really connected to a bunch of other stuff. So it's not, just, uh, it's not just the file system you can blame, right, when something is not going as you would expect. Um, the other thing I want to, would like to mention, and this is actually part of the block layer as well, but you can have more, uh, more technology in the stack. You can, you, can use, uh, you can use device mapper or you can, you can use MD rate. So uh, you might probably know that some file system, like for example, ButterFS does, they, they have this uh, um, advanced features like snapshotting and they can be created on top of the several block devices and stuff like that, but uh, some file system doesn't have this support. But you can still use uh, something like Device Mapper to provide it, that uh, functionality. So uh, even though some file system seems to have less features than the others, it doesn't mean that they can be used in, in the same way if you, if you use some other stacks, like for example, uh, Device Mapper. So this is the overview of uh, Linux IO stack. You can see on top of the, uh, on top of the stack, this is the, actually the file systems, and this is the block bags file system and the other ones. And uh, you can see that, I mean, it's connected to, uh, it's connected to page cache, it's connected to uh, block layer, and uh, this is actually when I stop paying attention down there, right? I, I, under the block, block layer, I don't really care all that much. Maybe um, just, to know there's one problem here. The LVM doesn't really belong to block layer, but that's just the oversight, I think. So you have the general idea where file systems are put in the Linux kernel. And you can see that the, uh, this, this whole system is closely connected to the other, other parts. Anyway, um, those, I, I mean, there, there are four file systems in the table. This is kind of a shocking table, I guess. But the, uh, the ext3 doesn't really belong that, there, right? 
This is not, not the most active local file system at all. The only reason it is in the table is to give you a comparison to the, I mean, to the old file system. And I mean, who, who uses ext3? Just raise your hand if you, it's actually, oh, it's not that bad. I mean, it could be less, that's, uh, I mean, we are trying to get rid of ext3 for a long time, to be honest, right? Because we, what we do in, uh, in ext4 is when we find a, find, a, find a bug and then we fix them, then we have to go to ext3, find the bug there, and fix it once again, right? And sometimes we forget. So then when you have the situations where it's already fixed in ext4 and it reappears in ext3, you know, a couple of months uh, later. And that's a problem, right? So uh, aside from this thing, there's also the performance concerns. And it is, it has to be said that ext4, like a file system, performs usually much better than ext3. It has, uh, it has some features which uh, allows them better to, to scale better on the bigger, uh, bigger file systems on the you know, variety of wor workloads. So, uh, and you can see that with number of commits here, that ext3 isn't really, um, you know, you can't compare it to the other file systems. So uh, you can see that all the work, all the efforts of, of the file system developer developers are put into the other file systems, not the XC3, right? Um, the other interesting number is ButterFS. There are like uh, twice as many commits as the other file systems. They have, uh, you know, more, more active de developers than the other file systems. And uh, you can tell that, you know, this file system is really uh, undergoing a heavy development. They are still, not feature complete, they are still developing and, and trying to complete all the features they promised they will have. They still have some performance issues and other issues as well. Uh, they are not as stable as the other file systems. So they are still undergoing a habit development process. Uh, regarding the number of lines, number of, lines of code, um, was somewhere in the middle of the 2012 where ButterFS file systems exceeded XFS file system in the number of lines of code, which is interesting because uh, EX, XFS was considered to be, by some to be, con uh, it was considered by some to be uh, too complex. I mean, too complicated with the huge code base, you know, to maintain. Um, it was true, it was true, you know, but they are trying to, uh, get rid of the old stuff that doesn't really, you know, uh, doesn't really need to be there. They they improve things. They have some optimization and stuff like that. So they are uh, they are uh, lowering number of lines of code while uh, you know uh, introducing better better uh, algorithms and uh, making the file system perform better. Um, you can see that ext ext3 it's uh, out of out of the scope of this thing, right? It's just a flat line almost it doesn't doesn't do any much much of the development there, so we don't have any any major increase of number of lines. Um, ext4, you know, this is decent number. It's it's uh, xfs actually has like twi twice as much uh, code in there. Um, what it means is that yes, XFS is more, compli more complicated and more complex than uh, uh, ext4 is, but on the other hand, it performs better in certain certain scenarios. So you can you will see that later as well. So there are some challenges we are facing we are facing today. Uh, the, as the common hardware capabilities increase, like the storage capability of the, car, of the hardware increases, we'll have to deal with bigger and bigger file systems, bigger and bigger files, file sizes. And the file systems, some file systems are not really ready for, for this kind of thing. For example, ext3 is absolutely out of scope of this, of this process. ext4 only recently got uh, support for file systems bigger than 16 terabytes, but they still have limit of the, of the file size. You can't create file bigger than 16 terabytes. Still. <coughs> On the other hand, XFS, they scale very, very well. They have, uh, you know, they perform very well uh, up to hundreds of terabytes. So this is, this is I mean, the main difference here. 
Uh, aside from the, you know, the storage space uh, scalability, uh, we'll face problems like, uh, because we have, you know, servers have more, more CPUs, they have more processes going on, more processes or threads are actually, uh, you know, touching the file system, working with the file system. So we have to optimize uh, things for, you know, concurrency. Um, and the last, last scalability issue we have, I mean, we've seen, just recently we've seen uh, SS, coming SSDs, they are much, much faster than regular spinning disks, right? But they are not like, uh, they are much faster, but they are not like crazy fast, right? They still, it still performs well enough, even with the stack we have. But there are other devices like PCI attached SSDs and stuff like that, and this is becoming to be different issue. Uh, we are we are uh, hitting the issues in the block layer itself, where it no longer scale at this you know number of IOPS. So uh, this problem has already been solved in the networking, and so we we have at least we have uh, the place where to take ideas from and where we can learn from. So block layers will, and actually the the process already started. Uh, they are trying to take ideas from, from the ne networking subsystem to actually implement stuff differently in the block layer to make things go faster. Um, real, reliability. Reliability is an uh, important issue, especially it's going hand in hand with uh, scalability. Because once you grow the file system into sizes of petabytes, you have like terabytes of metadata. And uh, being able to check the metadata for correctness or even repair the metadata is becoming to be an issue of time and also of memory because you'll have to have the, all the metadata in memory. Uh, this problem has been tackled in several file systems, but the general idea is that it's not, it will no longer be viable to actually do the offline check and offline repair. We will have to eventually go and do the online um, metadata repairing and checking tool because it's no longer viable to check, to you know, put the file system offline and check it for several hours, something like that, or even repair it for days, right? It's not, no longer viable. So uh, online checks has to be implemented eventually. We also, we need to we need to detect those errors on the fly. That's, that's the first thing we have to do on the, on the way to the online checker. And uh, the, I mean, the first logical step would be the metadata, metadata checksumming. This has been tackled by several file systems already. Some of them already implemented that. Some of them, like .rfs, has, you know, in, has this in, included in its design. So they, by design, they can, uh, they can uh, do checksumming of the metadata or data. Uh, but that's not enough, right? Metadata checksumming on its own doesn't help you with, uh, with the online checker. You have to, you have, to have other, other means to actually be able to fix the problem, find blocks which has been disconnected from, from the object and stuff like that. So you will have to have uh, metadata to be self-describing. So when you find a block which, has been, which is metadata block, but it, it has been uh, disconnected from the, other, from the other metadata or other blocks it has. So it, you have to know that this is really, it really belongs to your file system. You have to know who's the owner of the metadata. And uh, this same actually uh, applies to data as well. Even though in file systems, uh, we used to joke that we don't really care about the data. Every time we do the file system check or do even the online checks, we don't really care about data. We don't check the data at all. You know, this, is the, this is problem of the user, not our problem. We need to know where our data are, and that's it, you know? Um, the next challenge we have is new types of storage. Um, as I've, I've already mentioned SSDs, so uh, we have, you know, you can get decent performance out of SSDs, but as I, as I mentioned as well, uh, PCI attached SSDs are much faster than that. We'll have to tackle, you know, uh, the other parts of the of the I/O stack to actually be able to support it well and get the decent performance out of it. And uh, uh, this is 
if you remember, there has been issues with uh, SSDs and wear leveling. Those kind of issues are mostly solved by the hardware itself. It still will, it will still need things like disk card. If you know what disk card is, it's actually the interface we can tell to the device that we don't longer use those kind of blocks, you know, the set of blocks we don't no longer use, and the, and the device can use it for whatever internal operation they are doing. So uh, it may you know, speed up the device itself. But they are doing a pretty decent job in uh, actually managing it also th themselves. So they have some hidden pool of, of blocks they are using to remapping uh, blocks and so on and so forth. So um, this problem is probably already solved in this area. But uh, uh, we, we are s increasingly seeing storages like thin thinly provisioning storage. Um, just recently, I, I'm not sure which, which kernel version it was, was uh, uh, being a DM, DM thin P target was matching to the kernel so you can, uh, with, uh, with LVM actually, you can use LVM to create your thinly provisioning storage and you can, uh, you can actually use it. And this is the, I mean, the thinly provisioning storage has the similar problem as the, as the SSDs have, right? They need to know which blocks are not longer used so they can reuse it for someone else. The problem is a little bit different in the way that for SSDs is performance problem, but for thin provisioning, it's, uh, I mean, it's problem of having full storage and not being able to write anything else, right? Even though uh, most of it is not longer used. So uh, this is where the, the concept of discard is becoming more more important, and we'll have to we'll have to use that. Uh, it has already been implemented in several several ways in file system. You can do the online discard, and you can do the offline offline discard as well. And you can use uh, batch discard. It means you don't have to do it. I mean, uh, you don't have to do it with every. Uh, when you when you free the blocks, you don't have to call it right away, but you you can wait, you know, gather the information and then do the discard on bigger extents. But that's implementation thing. I don't want to go there too deep. Uh, the other uh, interesting thing is hierarchical storage. Uh, this is usually used to hide really expensive, huge, you know, storage. Uh, uh, pardon, uh, inexpensive huge storage behind really expensive but really fast storage uh, in order to cache the data you are currently using because when you're using the data you work, work with, uh, with the fast storage and it's much faster and the data you're not touching are lying on the, on the slow, inexpensive, big storage behind it. Uh, we, are, we have a uh, DM cache uh, implementation which is going to kernel hopefully this merge window. And uh, this is something you will ab be able to use. So if you have your server, if you have your, your uh, desktop and you have one disk and one SSD and the SSDs are quite expensive still. So you can, it's, it will always, me I mean, it is still smaller than the regular disk, right? If you have four terabytes disk and you have I don't know, 500 uh, gigabytes of uh, SSD, you can put it in front of the four terabytes and you will have much faster, you know, the performance which will be much better than when, when you use just a regular disk. But uh, I, one thing I didn't mention with the thin provisioning and it is, uh, it applies to the caching as well, is that when you do this kind of magic with blocks behind the file system, the file system will lose all the information uh, about where its blocks are actually positioned on the drive itself. So all the optimization you're doing in order to you know, go and read it in one chunk, uh, allocate you know, metadata and data in the, in the same position you know, so you can read it faster, all those optimizations are useless. You, you no, don't longer have the advantage of those optimizations because the layer underneath you can relocate the blocks and you no longer have the locality in there. So this is, this is something which will have to be addressed as well. Next we have uh, issues with maintainab maintainability or manageability. It was a, um, 
before this uh, presentation, there was the other presentation about the open, open MMI. They are trying to solve this problem as well. But this is, this is just a subset of the problem. This is storage problem. And even, even when it's just a subset of the problem, we have, uh, I mean, the problem is big, really. Because uh, um, Linux kernel has several you know, number of file systems. And most of them are suited for, other wor for different workloads. And most of them have different options, different defaults, different uh, behaviors, different user space utilities. So in order to, to manage the system with you know, number of file systems, the administrator needs to know all the tools from all the different file systems, uh, needs to know all the defaults, all the features and options he can use for different file systems. And he has different tools for every action he can do with the file system. And it's not only limited to file systems. You, you can have different types of storage. As I, was, I, was, uh, <coughs> as I mentioned on the previous slide, you have different types of storage. And different types of storage usually have different requirements, right? I've mentioned this card. So with thin provisioning, you'll have to make sure that you don't fool your real storage underneath the, the thing you export to the user, uh, because then users start to see you know, errors and, and uh, write errors mostly, because the, file system, the, the storage would be full, and they will not longer be able to actually write into it, even though they will see that they have plenty of space, right? because you lied to them. You don't tell them the real storage you have. So, and, and um, pardon? Yes? When you run out of space, it actually halts I.O. So okay. you don't see I.O. errors. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I mean, but it's, it, it, this is still unexpected, right? The user don't want to run into this problem right away, right? He wants to have something to, you know, either tell him. We do have a notification. Yeah, yeah. The not notification is important, but there are some steps you can take uh, in order to prevent this issue, right? When you see that the, that the watermark is coming, you can do, for example, a fast stream on the file system. It will immediately free some space, and you will still have you know, more than you had before. And the uh, user will know, oh, this happened, right? I know that this is going to be full. I, need, I better you know, extend my storage. So yes, I mean, that's, that's the problem with different types of storage, right? Even, the, even though SSD supports this card as well, it's from different reasons and the administrator will have to know that. Uh, there's a problem with bigger sector sizes. Uh, this is mostly the problem of the kernel, and uh, we would be probably, I mean, th there's an argument whether the, devices itself, the device itself should be advertising that, or should hide that behind the, behind the firmware. So this hopefully will never get to the user it will never be, you know, the user question, you know, what to do with this kind of uh, hard drive and such a thing. And uh, I mean, this this is a similar problem with uh, when you have more, you know, deeper deeper uh, storage stack. Like for example, when you, you when you use LVM to create device mapper targets and stuff like that, then you have. Um, several device mapper targets, and all of them are different, and all of them are different options. If you, if you ever ever try to use LVM, for example, I mean, there are some people for LVM that are trying to convince me that it's really easy to use LVM, but for a, for a person who's not, I mean, who's not doing it every day, it's not that easy. Especially when you look at the manual page, and you'll see like, you know, stock piles of of, uh, of text. Which describing every single options and you know tons of options, but what you really what you really usually use is uh, you know it's small amount of options in the LVM. So it actually is easy, but in order to in order to actually learn this stuff is uh, the first step you need to know, you need to do. It's not it's not I mean it's harder than they think. So all of that combined. Is, uh, is really a problem. And uh, having a single centralized way to approach the, your storage and to manage that and to see all, all the things you have and to be able to create easily 
um, RAID with you know ext4 file system on top of it or uh, have ext4 file system or xfs file system and be able to snapshot it this is those are things you have to you you can do today you don't have to you don't need to use butterfs in order to snapshot you can use uh, you can use lvm right but it's not it's not well advertised it's not uh, you know obvious to users that you know i need snapshots what I'm going to do? I'm going to do. I'm going to use ButterFS, right? You don't have to. You can still use LVM on, and on top of that, you can still use whatever file system you want. So it is incredibly useful for the users to have the central point of view, central central tool to actually come to and use. But it's uh, it's incredibly important to have all the information into one, pay, uh, into one place. In my opinion, it's a must, right? You, this, this, is, this is no longer viable to go and gather the information around the system and try to pick you know, bits and pieces from all the, all the places over the system. So this is really important. And uh, there's a project which is trying to do something like that. It's called System Storage Manager. Uh, there's a website you can, you can visit. Uh, in the future, you've seen in the pre previous presentation, you've seen the mention of the Blivet, which is the Anakin the storage module. And in future, it will actually, hopefully, will be using the same stack. So it will be using Blivet and, uh, and will be able to do these things the same way as uh, OpenLMI and uh, other management utilities will. But as it is now, it has its own implementations, which might be. Uh, it might be actually pushed out of the SSN into into Blivet, but that's it's just a, it's just a common light tool, so you can use it over SSH, right? So this this solves different problem than uh, than OpenLMI. You will still you know you'll have your standard uh, you know command line tool to do your administration things, but you will have it's centralized in a way that you'll you have to you can manage uh, LVM on top of uh, ext4 on top of LVM and the butterfs in the same way, right? Does you just end up in a C library? no, it's it's written in Python. Yeah, but will you rewrite it in C? No. At some point of time. No. So uh, I would have to to include Python into the interface to use that from the interface, for example. From what? What? What FS? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, you. This is common line tool, so you you don't want to use it from something else. You want to use it directly. What you what you want to use is Blivet from the Anaconda storage yeah, module. No, it's written in Python, as well. And it. I, I don't think anyone will attempt even to write to rewrite in to C. I mean, just, just point out there are lib storage management and lib LVM, which I think will have C. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, lib storage management and lib LVM, which is different projects. Uh, this is actually a subset of the problem which uh, Blivet will solve, but they are written in C. And they have Python bindings as well. Okay, so let's go to something more concrete. Uh, what's, what's new in XFS? As you know, XFS is. Uh, it's been called a scalable file system. It scales quite well on the, on the large scale computers and bigger, um, uh, bigger storage. And, uh, what, but it had some troubles. It had some problems with metadata intensive workloads in the past. That's why it hasn't been used in that way. And uh, we actually encouraged people to use ext4, which has been you know, historically very good at this kind of workload. But some work has been done in this, in this area. Uh, they've implemented something called delayed uh, logging, which improved the, the, um, the performance of uh, you know, metadata-heavy workloads significantly. Uh, they, I mean, ext4 is maybe still faster on single-threaded uh, workloads, but, but when, once you start to scale up, then uh, ext4 no longer compete with that. You know they uh, they are uh, they have ext4 has its limits, but uh, xfs actually uh, scales up pretty pretty well. It's it's very impressive what they what they've done. Uh, 
but it required some some on disk format changes and uh, and stuff like that it actually required a lot of work to to be able to do that and as I mentioned uh, XFS already scales up to hundreds of terabytes and performs pretty well uh, so I would say that XFS is actually the file system you want to use when you have you know huge servers with lots and lots of storage and you're doing uh, you know uh, heavy IO into it you, you don't want to be using the XT4 anymore for this kind of for this kind of uh, workload So it's not uh, it's not backwards compatible if you if that's what you mean. Uh, from the rela reliability point of view, they started to work uh, on to address that problem. With uh, I mean, this is the first step, as I said, is metadata checksumming. So you need to know what 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 metadata you know if whether your metadata are valid when you write them or whether they are valid when you read them. You need to check that. This is the first thing to be able to actually detect the problems you might, you might see. And uh, this also required format change, and it also is not backwards com compatible change. But uh, they are, they've done the change in a way that uh, the future improvements into the reliability point of view uh, will not require any more, hopefully, any more format changes. They, they've tried to done it in the single step, so you don't, don't have these several steps. Um, I, mean, I think you can point out that I, I believe a new XFS file system will still read the old file systems without the metadata enabled. So the new kernel, will. of course, will support the old disk. Okay, so yeah. So you will still be able to, the new, the new uh, kernel module will still be able to mount and use the older one. But, uh, but not the other way around. Um, this is not yet, as far as I know, this is not yet upstream. This work is really close to be upstream, but not yet upstream. Hopefully this merge window may, may be the next. Uh, but let's, I mean, they, they are trying to focus on future work as well, right? So uh, they are focusing on things that Patrefs already has, right? The, the reverse mapping tree, so you can tell which, which data are actually belongs to, to what, uh, what, obje uh, what object. They, are, they will try to address the problem of uh, uh, correcting the metadata when you, when you figure out that, yeah, this is wrong and we have, we have means to actually fix that so we can attempt to fix that without the application even know that there, there has been a problem. So this is really important, as I said, when you scale up in size, then you'll have to have this kind of functionality. Okay. And there's online metadata scrap, which is, uh, I mean, something which Butterfuss already has. Uh, this, is the, 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 uh, this is the way to go through metadata and actually try to figure out which are, are wrong or, or bad or fix them if you have the means to do that. Uh, this is background process which is going on on the online file system. We don't have much time, so we'll, you know, probably don't get into Butterfs, but uh, you, you can you can catch me later. So about ext4, ext4 is uh, uh, has very long, long, uh, I mean, old architecture. It has been based on ext2 and ext3, and the changes are uh, incremental, but the uh, on disk format is, we are trying to keep it backwards compatible as, you know, as much as we can, and the format doesn't change a lot, right? We still use bitmaps for free, free space tracking. We still use the same, uh, uh, same structures. Uh, yeah. So there are some limitations to it, right? You, you have the limited size of allocation groups, you have the limit of the limited size of the file file size and stuff like that. There have been some some projects to which tr was trying which were trying to address the, the, the problem of huge file systems when the allocation was actually too slow to actually use the file system in any real way. You can't allocate several terabytes, you know, then uh, it takes several minutes to actually do the work. 
it's just no longer it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't scale. So there has been some improvements in form of a big alloc feature, which actually means that we group together several blocks into cluster, and the cluster uh, we use cluster as the smallest allocation unit. So uh, every time you create a file or write into a file, uh, then it will. I mean. <coughs> Every time you create a file, that file will always take the cluster, right? You can, when you write 4, 4, 4K into it, it will take whole, the whole cluster. So, um, there, I mean, Dave Chinner did the, the test with, uh, with a kernel tree, and it took like 160 gigabytes to actually save this tree with one megabyte big cluster which is crazy, but you will never use it that way, obviously, right? You will not use the cluster, uh, the big alloc file system to store small files because it doesn't make any sense. But there are some workloads which you will benefit from with this feature. Uh, the Pardon? What sort of cluster sizes would you say is typical? So typical cluster size, I mean, the default right now is uh, 64 kilobytes. So it's like, uh, I mean, six. 16 blocks. I mean, 16 blocks is the typical thing, yeah. Um, as I said, it's trade-off between the you know, uh, space utilization and the performance you can get out of it. There have been more improvements in the, in the, in the, del del <coughs> in the form of extent tree, which tracks the delayed extents and stuff like that as well. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That's the, I mean, this is kind of weird feature. It sounds, why would we do it? But the reason is that Google actually uses the workload which benefit very, very much from this kind of thing. So, and if, for, for, if you don't know, then um, ext4 maintainer actually works for Google. So that's, that's the reason we are going there. Uh, there has been some real reliability improvements in the user space utilities, because uh, obviously, um, as I said, you have to have you have to you have limited amount of memory you can you know you can use for the file system checker. So what we've done, uh, we've changed the way we actually read and allocate the the space for metadata. We no longer use just plain bitmaps. We're using we're using extent extent tree to actually track the the free space in the in the user space utilities. So it might not be faster, but it definitely is uh, uh, better for your memory, right? And it will be faster if in, in a case that you run out of memory and you need to swap. So in this case, you might not need to swap, so it might be actually faster than the other way around. Um, we've, this is actually old news, but uh, the file system creation is much faster than it used to be. It took several minutes to create a 10 terabyte file system, right? And it no longer takes this, this ridiculous amount of time. Uh, the feature, the other feature is obviously metadata checksumming because we are going all the same way to actually uh, address the problem of uh, metadata corruption and to be able to detect the metadata corruption before the application hits that. So uh, the, we already have that in the kernel. However, it's off by default. You, you don't have it you know, by default. You have to. You have to specifically allow that. What's in your but in ButterFS? I, I, I'm, there's no point in talking about scalability because uh, file system, I mean, ButterFS has different issues, totally different issues right now. They have stability issues, that's, that's what they have. Uh, so the, the in performance and scalability is out of question right now. They are trying to finish the features they are they promised, the features the file system can support. They are trying to stabilize the file system so we can actually use it reliably. Uh, as I said, and if, as you've seen on the table on the second slide, is that it's still under heavy development. There are a lot of work putting putting into it to actually make it make it stable, make it work. And it's important to know that stabilization takes a lot of time. So for for for, for those who are you know asking why it takes so long, right? We are talking about ButterFS for several years now. It actually, it's it's process which takes decade to actually do it properly and have the file system which is stable and you can use in a, in a you know proper way. 
Um, as far as re reliability goes, uh, aside from the fact that the file system, the ButterFS file system isn't as stable as the other ones, uh, the fact is that the ButterFS file system has you know, great means to actually uh, you know, improve the reliability of the file system. They have all the checksumming they, they, they need, they have all the, all the back references they need, so they are able to actually track their data and find the, the data they, they need. However, uh, it still needs some optimizations and some work to actually be able to use this. this. But the design allows to do you know, much more than in the other file systems right now. So I'll cut it right here. And if you have any questions, yes? Uh, it was that meme a few years ago, you know, ButterFS is going to wipe out everything else in no time. To, uh, I think most people knew it was Charles at the time, but it's clear we will have a variety of file systems oh, yeah. for a long time to come. To me, that looks healthy. And do you think, as a, someone actively involved in this, that Definitely. I, I mean, between the file systems helps to push them forward? And, is that any part of your motivation? Oh yeah, definitely it is. I mean, there has been, um, there's this tension between the file system developers, right? I mean, uh, that's not that, like we hate each other or, you know, be mean to each other, but, friendly. you know, me, yeah, in a friendly way, they usually make fun uh, from, you know, the XFS people make fun, fun from uh, the uh, EXT4 people because, you know, they are doing, you know, pretty well in some workloads and, uh, after the work they've done in the past years, they, they are actually much better in every respect. So, yes. And there's a lot of fun to be made from out of butter of us people, right? Because it's not stable, it's not ready, yeah? It's funny, haha. But, you know, it's, it's actually a lot, lot of work required to make it stable, make it work. So, yes, oh, there are a lot of file systems to be had in the future as well. And uh, some of them actually covers different use cases, right? But ButterFS will never, never be your choice number one if you go with performance, right? They are not designed to actually do that. If you want, uh, if you want uh, your database stored in the, in the ButterFS, it's a really bad idea, right? If you have your uh, VM images stored in ButterFS, again, very bad idea. And this is by design. I mean, the file system was designed uh, uh, in, the, in the way that you can do copy and write and the whole file system is copy and write actually. So this kind of workloads are excluded from, you know, from the use cases of ButterFS. It might be better in future, it probably will be, but you know, as it is now, it's not very usable at this, at this point. So yeah. You can try, it'll just take a long time for it to finish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, then I'll be around.